the people for which you need to ask forgiveness from them. They are not necessarily connected. A sin against an individual is not necessarily seen as a sin against God. Whereas in our Christian understanding, when I sin against a brother, it is a sin against someone who is a brother in Christ, part of the body of Christ. It is a sin against someone who's been created in the image of God. It is a sin against the divine reflection of God. My sin against you is also sin against my father. That is a radical change. But the other radical thing that is going on here is the Jewish practice had grown in that time into this idea, and, and we still have Yom Kippur, and our Jewish brothers and sisters certainly engage in forgiveness throughout the year, but it had been so changed in the minds of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and teachers of the day. Yom Kippur, which is getting ready to happen here at the end of this month, what was being taught in that day is that was the Day of Atonement. And you would basically kind of save up all of the bad things that you had done through the entire year to other people and to God. And you would say a private prayer. And that private prayer would go something like this. Basically saying, I hope that everyone forgives me for all the sins I committed against them. God, I hope that you will forgive me for all the sins I committed against you. The end. And at the end of the Day of Atonement, the page is turned and all things are over. There is no teaching an idea of me then approaching you and asking for your forgiveness. There is no face-to-face -face that is happening there. There is no relationship that is happening there. And so for the first century mind of what was being taught, it was a purely head exercise that happened always at the end of the year of the Jewish year and this day of atonement. What Jesus is teaching his disciples and the original intention of this idea of atonement is that it needs to be an ongoing activity. And so Peter, when he comes to Jesus, thinks that he is being extraordinarily gracious thinks that he is being outstanding when he says to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. Peter is choosing a number of perfection, a number that was revered within the Jewish culture. Seven is the days of creation and perfection and all of those things. So he's like, okay, normally I am taught I don't need to do anything until the end of the year when I say, okay, everybody's forgiven, and move on. And that's a one-time deal. And so Peter's like, okay, I'm going to do it seven times. Surely Jesus is going to be impressed with that. Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Sometimes it gets translated as seven times seven. This writer's letting you off the hook right when was the last time you forgave someone seven times for something? When was the last time you forgave someone 77 times for something? When was the last time you forgave someone seven times seven times? Jesus is teaching Peter and teaching us that forgiveness is how we bear the cross of Christ into the world. Forgiveness is a daily exercise. Forgiveness is something that we do ongoing. And so that's why he uses this outrageous number of 77 times or 7 times 70. And then as Jesus is wont to do, he uses a parable to teach the disciples and to teach us about forgiveness. So let's dive into that. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven, which for Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is not necessarily that thing that comes at the end of time. Jesus is teaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and is breaking in to this earth and this world that you know right now. 
It's almost as if there's this other world that's the kingdom of heaven. It is enclosing in on the earth, and the crucifixion event is a tear in space and time and all of those other cool sci-fi movies that you've watched before, and the kingdom of heaven is happening. It is coming to fruition here in this place. So we shouldn't think of it immediately in our heads of, oh, that's what Jesus is talking about heaven sometimes in the future. No, Jesus is talking about the here and now when he says the kingdom of heaven. And he says the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents. Let's stop right there. The disciples are laughing at this point. They're la they may not be laughing out loud, but they're certainly laughing inside. Why is that? This is a slave who owes... 10,000 talents. Let's do some math. That translates to $2.25 billion in modern day money. $2.25 billion with a B, not even an M. And this is a slave. And so Jesus is saying this parable, here's this slave who hardly earns anything who owes his master $2.25 billion. And the master's going to try and get it out. And you can just imagine the disciples going, oh, this is not going to work out well. How does a slave owe $2.25 billion? How? How? And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife, and his children, and all of his possessions and payments to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay you everything. Again, the disciples are probably laughing on the inside, if not out loud. How is it going to be possible for this slave, throughout his entire life, to be able to pay $2.25 billion to the master. It is impossible. And yet this slave thinks that somehow he is able to do it. My brothers and sisters in Christ, that slave is us. That slave is us. Our lives to ourselves are certainly worth more than $2.25 billion. Think about all of the other gifts that God has given us. Ourselves, our time, our talents, our treasures, our families, our children, our callings, our jobs, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, this land that we live in, the ministry to which we've been called. All of those other blessings which we do not deserve because we are also sinful and rebellious. Because we oftentimes chase after idols instead of God. And so not only do we have all of these things and blessings that have been given to us, all of these things we could not possibly have earned, it's way more than $2.25 billion. And yet sometimes, sometimes, we're as bold and as audacious as that slave thinking that we can hope to impress God and pay Him back. That we can hope to impress God and pay Him back. There is no way, my brothers and sisters in Christ, there is no way we can ever even hope to pay back God even just any, any bit of what we owe for our lives, for our forgiveness, for eternal life. For any of those things. And yet we sometimes think, oh, well, I'll pray tonight. Or I'll read the Bible a little bit more. Or, oh, I'll do these few things. And yet, somehow God will then be impressed by the thing, those small things. We're not going to win if we try and play that with God. 
There's no way we can hope to pay back God, and there's no way we can hope to play God that way. And so what is our task? Take a look at what happens in tonight's story. Out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. Out of pity for him. God looks down on us. And out of pity for us, out of love for us, out of recognition that we are his own children, his own creation, that we are a reflection of his divine self, out of all of those things, God looks down on us. And even though we owe him such a great price, and so much more than 2.25 billion, God, who is gracious and merciful, forgives us. Regularly, all the time, forever and ever and ever, constantly forgiving us in order to pull us back as his children, to win us over, to bring us alongside him as his children. But what do we do sometimes? And what does the slave do? That same slave, as he went out from that very moment, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Do math again. About two thousand dollars in modern day. Two point two five billion. Two thousand. Grabs him by the throat and says, pay what you owe me. Then his fellow slave fell down doing the exact same thing that he had just done and pleads with him doing the exact same thing that he had just done, saying the exact same words, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. And brothers and sisters in Christ, how often do we withhold that forgiveness that has first been given to us? From those who are in need of hearing a forgiving word in this world. So what is forgiveness? What does it mean to forgive? Even the word forgive is unique. The word that we have, the English word that we have, actually comes from a Latin word that was created by a translator. This Latin translator was, was looking at a Greek text. And this Greek fable was talking about an individual who was condemned to die. Rightfully so condemned to die. And yet, that person was given life back. And so, this was a such a unique gift that the word gift was not enough to describe. And so, the person who was writing it and trying to translate it created the word forgiven. Because this person was given back their life even though they did not deserve it. And so when we forgive someone, it is against maybe the natural justice of this world. The natural justice of the idea of the wrong must be punished. But when I forgive you, say, I forgive you. I am giving your life back. You owe me no more debt. We are even. We're good to go. Sometimes, though, we don't understand. Sometimes, though, the way we think about forgiveness prevents real forgiveness from happening between brothers and sisters in Christ. 
and other people. Sometimes we consider forgiveness condoning. Oh well, the thing that they did wasn't really all that wrong. So it's okay. I'm going to condone the behavior. So the lie that they told, the pain that they inflicted, the family chaos that happened, it really wasn't that big. So we're going to go ahead and condone it. Not really all that long. That's one of the things that we do. That's a fallacy in regard to forgiveness. One of the other things that we tend to do is we tend to excuse behavior. We don't want to hold the offender responsible. So-and-so had a rough day. So-and-so got a bad evening. They acted out because of some other external cause in their life. So we're going to excuse the behavior and say, that's okay. Or we sometimes forget. We engage so fast in our cycle of life that when an individual wrongs us, we're moving on to the very next thing, and maybe we forget about it back in our head, but that relationship is still strained and broken. <coughs> so we forget about it. Or sometimes there is, there is this pretend reconciliation. It's a little bit of a combination of all of the other ones, but it's a... Let's not talk about what happened, but let's just move on. None of those is forgiveness. None of those. All of them withhold forgiveness between the offender and the offender. It is a withholding of that which God wants you to freely give. I want you to do an exercise with Everybody comfortable? Good? Alright, take a deep breath in for the count of three. One. Now hold it. Keep holding it. Hold it as long as you can. Okay, I'm turning purple. Does that feel good to let it go? Yeah? When you're breathing in the forgiveness of God, and that becomes part of your regular life, you're holding on to it, that's hurting you, and it's hurting other people. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to forgive. Think about it. When was the last time that you said to someone, I forgive you? When was the last time that you said to someone, I forgive you? Think about that for a minute. If you can't remember, it's been too long. So what does forgiveness look like? How do we engage in this process? The very first thing that we need to do, that the gospel lesson teaches us tonight, is A, get down on our knees. Get down on our knees and beg our Lord, our Master, our Savior for forgiveness. Because we owe so much and we are sinful and rebellious. Every single day. Every single day. We go astray. And yet God constantly forgives us. But sometimes, we forget about that. So every single day, we need to be about that practice of getting down on our knees and praying to God for forgiveness. Trusting that He does. Because He does. Because He's God. And that's what God does, is for you. And so as we do that, as we come to the daily constant realization of all that God is forgiving of us, 
then we're ready to forgive. It's this idea of breathing in and breathing out. If I don't have any air in my lungs, I can't breathe it out onto anyone. I first need to breathe it in before I can breathe it out. I cannot give forgiveness out of the nothing that I have. I need to first receive forgiveness from God before I can then freely give it to others. That's why this parable is constructed this way. This one slave has shown such graciousness that the expectation should be that as soon as he walks out and sees his fellow slave who only owes him $2,000, that he should run to him and without even a word from that other slave should forgive him the debt. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as we have been forgiven so much, we need to run from this place. We need to run from our knees every single day and find the person that has wronged us and forgive them right away. After having received that forgiveness, we run to them and forgive them. The third thing about forgiveness is it becomes a regular practice for us. It is not a one-time event. How many of you have spouses or children? Significant others in your lives. All right. Imagine what life would be like for you if you told your spouse or your child one time, I love you. The only time, one time. How's that gonna go for you? Not so well, is it? Forgiveness is constant, and ongoing, the seventy times seven. So, for the you know you know how guilty you feel. I know how guilty I feel when I've wronged someone, and it's one time I forgive you, brother. Another time, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you. Honestly, I really do forgive you. Honestly, I really do forgive you. How many times do you need to be told I love you? That's how many times you need to tell other people I forgive you. Because guilt and shame and anguish and brokenness in relationship constantly wears on the soul, and so you need to constantly breathe forgiveness into their lives. You have that great gift. God gives you the great gift of restoration. And that restoration is found in the three simple words, I forgive. So let's do another little exercise. Another breathing. And I want you to remember what this was like. How, how many of you know how to swim? How many of you had a dad like mine where, okay, we're going to learn how to swim. Chris, into the deep end. <laughs> and you're just <coughs> struggling. And your, your, your instinct is only to get to that air. And it's crazy and it looks wild and it feels unnatural. But eventually, you start to figure it out. You start to get a little bit more coordinated and you start to look a little bit better as you're gliding through the water. You start to breathe on both sides without choking on water. And it becomes a regular pattern in your life as you're swimming along, breathing in and out. It's something that requires practice. It's something that you need to engage in regularly. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to do a little exercise right now. And I want you to just kind of, I'm not going to force you. So if, if you're not ready to engage in a, a, a portion of this, um, I'm going to ask you to think about an individual in your life that is wrong. I'm going to ask you to say to yourself or out loud, I forgive you. But if you're not ready to do that, don't. If you're not ready to do that just yet, 
Remember, this is a calling upon each and every single one of us. And the hurts that have been done to us are entirely different. Some of them are great, some of them are small. But the start, the very beginning of the start, of carving out that malignant tumor that is growing with inside of you, saying, I forgive you. So if you'll join me, just come close your eyes. Just breathe in and breathe out. Nice and easy. Just breathe in, hold it for a moment, and breathe out. And as you're breathing in, just say to yourself, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. When you breathe out, imagine that person that is wrong. When you breathe out, say to yourself, I forgive you. Lord, forgive me. I forgive you. Lord, forgive me. I Lord, forgive me. I forgive you. Lord, forgive me. Brothers and sisters of Christ, this is the air that we breathe. Forgiveness gives us life. Forgiveness pulls us out of the depths of hell. Forgiveness wakes us up from our dead selves and calls us to our better selves. Forgiveness was won for us on the cross. Forgiveness is the air that we breathe. Forgiveness is the air that other people need to breathe. And you are the ones who carry oxygen for them. Simple words, I forgive you, will change your lives and yours. Amen. We have a few announcements tonight. A reminder that the Tuesday Bible study is at 5.45 in the morning. Wednesday at 1800, we'll meet for an opportunity to gather together here in prayer. Pray for the, and give thanks to God for the praises that uh, He has, and the blessings He has bestowed upon us, but to also lift up all of those same prayer requests. And wherever two or three are gathered, there is God amongst us. And wherever two or three agree on something, God will hear those prayers. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, we want that circle to grow. We want that circle to grow, not only because we need to be engaged in prayer, but we need to be engaged in prayer community. And every person that joins that prayer circle brings the praises and prayer requests of their brothers and sisters, their co-workers as well. And so if you want to benefit others in your life, one way of doing that is by bringing their praises and their prayer requests to that circle. Because all of us will engage in that. I know personally I take the little slip of paper that's given out at that prayer circle. And I keep it in my little man first pouch thing uh, throughout the week. And I look at that. And I pray for all of those people regularly throughout the week. You're invited to join us for that. At 18.30, we're uh, entering into a Bible study. We're going to be starting a, a new book this time. It's actually a, a great uh, free book. Uh, and we'll send out information about that. Um, it is uh, by uh, John Piper and uh, Mathis. Uh, Acting the Miracle is the name of the book that we're going to do. And uh, there's a website where you can download the PDF book of it for free. And that, that's a great thing that we can engage in. Following that, we have Bible study for about an hour. If you would like to engage in educating people in the English language, we engage, we engage in a English, English, if I could speak it correctly, English language conversational time where we just kind of get around and folks get around and, and, and talk and, other, and, and folks join in and up to learn how to speak much better than I am. Thursday night, as always, we have our movie night at 1900. We have pizza, we have sodas, 
We have lots of popcorn, uh, and we have a brand new projector which shows uh, things very brightly. And uh, I'm not quite sure what the movie will be this week yet, but we normally send that out around Tuesday. Or Friday and Saturday, I like to say, remember, if you sing in the shower or if you make any sort of noise, join the choir and they'll teach you how to make a joyful noise to the Lord. It is great walking by this place out in the evenings on Friday and Saturday when the door is wide open and you can hear the praises to God coming out and everybody out there listening to it. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, on Saturday, there's Bible study that meets upstairs at 1900, and it's a men's Bible study. Next slide. And then uh, there we go. Padre PT every Monday through Friday at 4:30 over at the prison gym, an opportunity to get together and engage in some physical activity with a, a bunch of other folks. I like to say that at the end of it, you will be either thanking God that it's over or praying that it's over. One of the two. And then you can also watch our uh, sermons and our series here at uh, Rally Point Chapel on uh, YouTube uh, if you've missed a week or anything else. Yeah. Does so anybody have any other announcements I might have missed? Then let us please stand and receive the benediction of the Lord. And now may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The God of all grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. And now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Forgive regularly. Love and thank God. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us.